Amen. Welcome back. Um, glad you're here today. We had a great night's rest. I hope you did as well. And we're looking forward to what God has for us today. Um, we're going to kind of start in a hopscotch manner. Uh, we're going to look at two different um, two different issues that we kind of began last night, and then we're going to jump over um, and do a, a two different texts uh, later in the day then as part of that. So um, I want to start back in Genesis. Actually, let's go to uh, Psalms. Um, I guess let's do that first. Let's do Psalm 55. Psalm 55. So we talked about um, these things that happen to us, and uh, these first section here, these first five, um, someone noted that they were alphabetical, <clears throat> and then, then I messed it up, and uh, they were very disappointed in me and whatnot. But um, uh, anyway, I, I, um, I call these the ABCs of emotional trauma. Okay. And so, in other words, these are the, the things that are most prominent when we deal with emotional um, trauma. And I want, I want you to take a look with me. Um, we're going to look at Psalm 55. I hold your place there, but I'm going to kind of talk you through it real quick. And I'm, I do this, by the way, I do this in um, conferences a lot when I'm teaching. Um, well, we do, we do a outreach meetings this way. And so we'll rent a um, facility, we'll promote and advertise that we're going to have a um, night dealing with emotional trauma, and we're going to give away a copy of emotional, the book Emotional Pain. And I've done this actually all over, uh, all over the world. We did it in the Philippines, we've done it a couple times in, in Europe and South America and whatnot. And um, <clears throat> so often what happens is, is we have a lot of uh, professionals come. We have a lot of um, psychiatrists, psychologists, medical doctors, and so forth. And so I always start this way, what I'm about to show you, and then I work backward to the scriptures because um, I want them to see what we're talking about and then, and then understand that why, why we illustrate what we are going to do here um, is not because we read it in a medical journal or we learned it through clinical study, literally everything I'm about to show you comes directly from the Bible, but you don't, but the truth is, is so clear when people see it. I, I'll ask, I'll, I'll often ask at the uh, in, end of presenting this before I get into the scripture, how many of you recognize this, what I just shared with you is, is the truth, and they'll raise their hand like, yes, absolutely. I mean, always the psychiatrists and psychologists raise their hand, yeah, that's true. And I'll say, well, it's not true because you learned it or you've exa experienced it. It's true because came from the Word of God. This is the source of truth. This is the source of truth. Right? By the way, not medical studies. This is the source of truth. Right? Medical studies can support the truth, but medical studies are not the source of truth, and that's important for us to understand. But when we talk about emotional pain, um, I think about this as, as a reservoir, if you will, okay? So we're going to kind of draw a little reservoir around here. And these, these um, sources, these rivers, so to speak, flow into our reservoir. So uh, we have abuse, betrayal, conflict, and death. You know, um, and disease can go in there also. So... Everyone experiences these in some fashion during their life. Um, everyone is going to have some, some level of emotional trauma that they experience. That's just a reality. And some have a, a far ex more extreme level of emotional trauma. But the interesting thing about it is emotional trauma is not based upon the extreme nature of what you experience. It's based upon your reference point, right? So people... Um, maybe who grew up in a Christian home who didn't experience these things to a, to a great degree can still have emotional 
pain in their life because their reference point is so much, their threshold is so much lower. Does that make sense? Um, if you grew up in a home where, where literally physical violence and, and vulgarity and, and abusive you know, stuff and conflict uh, happens regularly, their, your threshold becomes higher for what you consider traumatic. It's, it's ama- kind of amazing how, um, how much that happens, so to speak, uh, because I'll sit in counsel with people who grew up maybe in a pastor's home, and quite literally, they're like, my dad yelled at us one time, and it was just traumatic, and I'm thinking, well, the last person I counseled um, was, you know, and, I, and I'm not, I don't exaggerate this in any fashion. I, I counsel with people that have had very, very horrible experiences and, you know, um, being being raped by a stepfather and the mother catching and then kicking the daughter out because she was trying to steal her husband and things. I mean, that's just, that's way more traumatic than your dad yelled at you. But but both of them see it the same way in their own perspectives. That makes sense? So I say it that way because I don't want to, I'm not trying to diminish people who maybe haven't had as, if we looked at a spectrum of severity that doesn't mean, you know, you can't sit down with someone and say, well, come on, just suck it up, you know, move on, quit, quit feeling bad for yourself or something like that. Because it's, it's all based on your personal experience and perspective and, and how you've perceived things and viewed things. But all of these things contribute. Um, when we talk about conflict in particular, conflict is one of those things that uh, is, is an, a really interesting um, factor because I mentioned last night, it, especially if conflicts between mom and dad, and the, that um, creates a significant amount of insecurity. Um, this is personally where where I dealt with things right here um, because uh, uh, my parents and and I, I say this with their permission. Um, by God's grace, they have gotten victory over all this. But when I was very young. My mom and dad were in constant conflict. I mean, fighting, screaming, stomping feet. I, I, I mean, it was it was a bad situation. That, by God's grace, no physical violence in in the sense of abuse or anything like that. But uh, but I remember as an eight year old um, packing my bag and my brother's bag and going with my mom and we left dad. And and I remember standing by her when she made a phone call to the church secretary because my dad was a pastor and said. You tell him when he wants a family, here's where he can find us. And, and um, I, I mean, I remember that experience and it, that conflict and the insecurity that it caused in me and the fear that it caused in me and, and so forth. And, and so then the responses that I had as a result of that. And so, um, but in counseling, I find this to be uh, very interesting because a significant amount of time when I deal with uh, specifically young ladies who cut, this is this this is a prime source of uh, emotional trauma for them. Conflict between the parents, um, and I and repeatedly in counseling that that being the case, and cutting is a huge huge issue um, in our culture in our day, um, and it can become incredibly severe and and habit forming uh, especially even and and habitual in that sense. So um, but so th- these are providing an inlet or producing an inlet of emotional trauma in a person's life. And so what they try and do is is escape that and uh, they want to uh, they want to avoid dealing with it because they don't know how to deal with it. They don't know how to reconcile it or make sense of it. And so they they look for escape hatches and, and as I mentioned, cutting believe it or not, is one of those escape hatches. It doesn't make sense for someone who's never um, experienced that and or been through it, but uh, in, in many ways, it's like this, this pain that I feel and this blood that I see makes more sense than what I'm experiencing. I can't understand and reconcile the pain that's in here, so this, this makes sense of that pain. And that's often what, um, what uh, escapes are for. They're for the purpose of making some sense of of a life that's chaotic and out of control. And uh, so escape uh, often comes in different varieties. And so uh, fear is one of those, um, you know, uh, and when we say fear there, we're talking more specifically about phobias and or uh, things, hyper control um, of 
of situations, perfectionism and so forth. It's not, not 100% created by this scenario. Sometimes it's a learned behavior. But often perfectionism and those type of responses can be the result of feeling completely out of control in other areas of life and trying to make sense of life. Um, uh, OCD can often be very, very much tied into uh, this type of uh, a scenario in the first generation, okay? I'm talking about first generation uh, situations. Um, uh, and, and many of these other issues as well uh, are, are, you know, created and, and, and responses, if you will. Addiction specifically is, is a huge response. So it's easier to crawl into a bottle and drown my sorrows than to deal with the emotional pain or it's easier to, you know, inject myself with that drug and or, uh, you know, smoke that marijuana or whatever it is because I don't know how to deal with this emotional pain. So escaping seems like my only solution. And so many, many different methods for for that, including promiscuity and, and all kinds of other things as well. So how do you deal with this? I mean, it becomes a um, a problem when when a person's trying to escape the the thing that they find is that the more they escape, the deeper the problems get because they magnify. Right? Um, what was a problem because of maybe abuse now um, I'm I'm pursuing um, escaping that, but then my escape produces other problems. Right? Um, uh, I I you know now I'm doing now I'm addicted to drugs and and I can't con- keep a job and I you know all these so now your problems begin to to multiply behind there and it just gets deeper and deeper and it seems overwhelming and that's why so many people resort to suicide because they can't see any way to overcome it. Marriage often. Marriage problems are not usually one problem. They're all the problems. Does that make sense? It's like it's not just one thing. It's, it's everything. And that's how life becomes when we're dealing with this type of a scenario. And so often marriage problems trace back to these issues. So how do you deal with that? Well, there's two, two things that have to happen. First of all, you have to create an outlet for um, this uh, pain. And so... Um, the outlet is uh, in in a in a broad sense, or is is that they have to communicate that pain. Okay, they have to they have to be able to pour it out, communicate it, and and talk about it, and and tell about it. Okay, um, and uh, so, but in a specific sense, we'll get to it in just a moment. But that's that's the the basic idea. And the second idea is you have to cut off the inlets here. You have to. You have to remove the power of these things in the person's life, right? So you have to cut off that source of, of um, pain coming in. So if you, if you stop trying to escape, you create an outlet, and you cut off the inlets, then what naturally happens is you drain the, the reservoir. All right, so all of that is pretty simple, clear um, to understand. I think everyone can understand this. Now... The way that happens in a psychologist setting, for instance, is that they say, you know, um, tell, tell me all about what happened and we'll talk therapy and, and pour it out in that fashion or um, so forth. And then the way that we deal with these, uh, these issues up here is maybe um, pharmacology um, and or, um, and or um, depending on the type of psychology, the school of psychology that the that the person adheres to, there's different practices and methods, right? So you have two different primary fields of psychology. You have expert knowledge and you have common knowledge. So your expert knowledge group would be Freudian, Skinner, Jung, and, and so forth like this. And, and so they each have somewhat different methods for coping mechanisms for the, the inlet Uh, issues and or blaming mechanisms which is a primary focus of ship blame shifting like it's not your fault so it's here's the person to blame and and uh, pour your uh, you know write write this or say this or do this and and so forth and then common knowledge would be uh, Rogers Rogerian philosophy um, which is uh, that that all the answers are inside of a person and uh, you're not to tell them any answers you're just to draw out the answers through reflective listening and so forth um, and you're drawing out the the truth that's inside of them uh, and that when they finally come to that truth that's inside of them then they'll have 
release from the trauma and, um, and, the, and they'll be free from that. And so these are the two primary methods, two primary methods, and there's a lot of other things that are wrapped up in that, but um, of, of secular psychology. So that's how a secular psychologist would, would um, deal with this. But the interesting thing about it is, is that um, I find that, and it, you, you, some, may, some may not like that I say this, but secular psychologists are looking for customers, not cures. So um, if you cure someone, they quit paying you, and then, then your business goes down. And that's just a reality. Um, so customers are more important. Uh, so keeping that customer base supported, all right? That's just a reality, all right? So the Bible is about cures. And so let's look at this passage here in Psalm 55, and, and let's make an application over here, okay? Okay. Um, So first of all, we see the problem of emotional pain. Look at verse number 3. It says, Because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they cast iniquity upon me, and in wrath they hate me. My heart is sore pained within me. Notice that emotional trauma, emotional pain there. The terrors of death are fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me, and horror hath overwhelmed me. So we see some some responses over here, fear and, and, uh, and horror and so forth. Hold your place here. Look back to Psalm 25, um, Psalm 25, because this is a consistent theme with David, actually. Um, in Psalm 25, uh, verse number 17, he says, The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Um, oh, bring thou me out of my distress. Look upon my affliction and my pain. And forgive all my sins. So there again, he talks about his heart and the tra- trauma and the and the pain. Look over to Psalm one o nine, Psalm one o nine. And um, here in Psalm one o nine, he talks about dealing with trauma as well. Um, and this is an imprecatory psalm in and part of it. But um, I want you to notice. Look at verse number um, twenty two. He says, for I am poor and needy, and he says, my heart is wounded within me. Now look at the response he has here. He said, I'm gone like the shadow when it declineth. So he was isolating, he was withdrawing, isolation over here. Um, uh, I am tossed up and down like the locust. He was on an emotional roller coaster, okay? My knees are weak through fasting. He couldn't eat. He was having the, you know, physical manifestation of his trauma. My flesh faileth of fatness. Um, I am become a reproach unto them. When they look upon me, they shake their head. That's, that's shame. So all of these things he's expressing are the result of the emotional pain that he was experiencing. And so these, uh, there's a lot of different things there. And we're going to come back. We'll come back to that thought there of that being imprecatory. But go back to Psalm 55. So we see the problem here, this emotional trauma, and, and we could examine the life of David and we could see the, the things that David went through. And so when I put these things up here, these are really reflective of David's life because David experienced abuse at the hands of Saul. Uh, he tried to kill him. Okay? He experienced betrayal as not only Saul betrayed him, but so many others betrayed him to Saul. Um, and he experienced conflict, no doubt about that, and, and then death because of all the, the battles and wars that he was in. All of those things are present in the life of David, are very easily identifiable in the life of David. But I want you to notice what makes them traumatic, and that's found here in this passage also in verse number 12, in Psalm 55 and verse number 12. It says, For it was not an enemy that did reproach me, Then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man, mine equal, my guide, my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked into the house of God in company. And so the the thing that made this emotional trauma was the closeness of the individuals that did this to him. All right. And, And that really is where emotional trauma stems from. It's, it's not that person that you know hates you. It is the people that are closest to you that you're vulnerable to, as we talked last night. And so that's where emotional... And that's what makes it so difficult to deal with, right? Because, uh, because there's a, a dichotomy of thought that takes place. It's like, well, my dad loves me. He said he loves me, and he abused me. 
And how do I reconcile those two things? How do I bring uh, any sense into this equation, right? Um, uh, or, or didn't protect me or whatever it is there. And so there's the, the trauma that comes in, and that's why it's, it's deep-seated and long-lasting, actually. And, and often what happens in traumatic experiences is there's a dis- there is a dissection or a, a, a distinction in experience and, and, and um, sensation and all of those type of things. By the way, they all go together, and I, I don't discount in any fashion... Uh, in any fashion, the it, the issues of how how uh, these things are processed and stored, right? Because in in reality, um, our, our brain is part of our flesh. Okay, it's made of flesh, right? All right, and it stores uh, memory and it stores thought and 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 processes all of those type of things. No doubt about that. I'm, I definitely um, I, I, the Bible clearly the Bible talks about the carnal mind and the word carnal there is the word sarks means flesh. It's, it's talking about your brain, okay? And uh, but we we create neural pathways of of thinking based on traumas and so forth. And often what happens with trauma is a a distinction, um, right brain left brain distinction that takes place that separates. Um, the ability to uh, codify and or consolidate a reasoning behind or through the trauma. And so um, things get isolated in traumatic experiences. And then without the ability to, to rectify those, um, uh, they become, they become, um, ice, they, they become uh, uh, stuck, so to speak, for lack of a better term. We just get stuck in the, in the particular issue. And so... Um, because of the closeness of the individuals typically that create such emotional trauma in our life, it creates that type of a, a dichotomy because um, on the one hand, I believe, I'm supposed to believe that this person loves me and on the other hand, they've hurt me and how do, I, how do I put those two things together and or I'm supposed to believe this person loves me and yet they did not protect me. How do I, how do I put those things together? It doesn't make any sense and that's what makes it so difficult to deal with. Now, notice... David's desire in verse number six, he says, and I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove for then would I fly away and be at rest. He's like, I I want to escape, right? I would hasten, I would wander far off and remain in the wilderness, Selah. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. So here's this escape process that we're talking about. Notice how all of these things are following following through here, the, the pain, the the sources, the escape. So then how do we find solution? The wonderful thing about the Bible versus everything else is everyone else is guessing and practicing. And God knows everything about us. And so he gives answers here, right? Um, it's, not a, it's not a trial and error with God. So he says here in verse number 16 of our text, he says, as for me, I will call upon God. The Lord shall save me. This is an interesting statement, right? He said, I want to escape, but what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to to pour it out. Now, this is so important because, okay, God knows how important it is to be able to pour these things out of the heart. As a matter of fact, Jesus speaks specifically about this when he says that out of the heart proceed the issues of life, right? And it's not what goes in the mouth that defiles a man, it's what comes out of the heart. That's where defilement comes from, is from the heart. And when he speaks about the heart, he's not speaking about the organ there. He's speaking about the seed of our emotions and and knowledge, right? He's speaking about about our inner man. The word heart, soul, and mind are interchangeable. Um, There's there's a whole lot of words that are translated into There's like over 40 words translated heart, soul, and mind, and many other ways as well. And and, um, so, it, it's, it's a whole different study. But, um, but when, when, when he says that, it's speaking of the fact that in, inner, in our inner man, in our inner being, these traumas fill up, and because we don't know what to do with them, they fester and they, they, they pollute us. And they have to be poured out. Okay? And he said, out of the mouth is where this comes. And so God said, you need to pour this out. Now, how does he want us to do that? He wants us to do that in prayer. He wants us to take our burdens 
to him and pour them out before him. And Satan knows how powerful this is because, you know, for instance, I don't counsel with women um, alone ever, ever. And I'll tell you why, because when people start pouring out their problems and they think you're listening and understanding, they do develop a, a warmness towards you. And that's just not, that's not a good situation to be in. And so my wife is always present and or does counseling with women when we, when we do that. And she does it alone if we feel like that's what's necessary. But, uh, but what we're goal, our goal is, though, is not to teach people to pour things out to us. It's to teach them to pour it out to Him. I'm not always available. I sleep. Some. But the Lord's always available. And you can always take your traumas to him and pour them out. As a matter of fact, Satan knows how powerful this is, so he decided to counterfeit it multiple different ways. And so it, he, he said, uh, well, don't pour it out to, to God. Instead, go to this man we'll call a, a, a priest. We'll call him your father. Pour it out to him. Then you'll feel warm toward the Catholic Church because they'll tell you you're absolved of all those wrong feelings and thinking and things that have happened to you and you'll feel warm toward them because you poured it out to them. Or you can go to the psychiatrist or psychologist or the counselor and you know pour it out to them and they'll tell you it's not your fault, it's someone else's fault and, and then you know, you'll feel warm toward them because you have poured it out. You poured it out and that makes you feel better. And it does, in a, at a certain level, make you feel better. And then came along, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and said, just pour it out to the whole world. Just put it out there on Facebook, you know, and Twitter. And, and then you'll feel better. But you don't because now you're betraying yourself. And uh, at, least, at least in the confessional booth and or the psychiatrist's office, there's a level of, of um, confidentiality, Right. But, but when you pour it out to the public, you might think you're going to feel better, but what you really feel is exposed and damaged. And you reinforce that feeling of being damaged in that fashion. And so God says, pour it out to me. He said, I will call upon God. And then in verse 17, evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. In verse 22, he says, cast thy burden upon the Lord for, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Now, how do I cast my burden on the Lord? This is actually an interesting, um, interesting concept because often the reason that counseling seems to help us more than just prayer, and I'm, I'm just follow me on this, is because the counselor is asking questions and, and he is sounding, if you will, into our thoughts and our, our heart and, and trying to reflect out some things, right? Um, counsel in the heart of a man is as deep water, the Bible says, right? And so we say, well, I don't know what to tell God. I don't know. I don't even understand how I feel. I don't know how to express it. You ever felt that way? So interestingly, um, music, is, uh, music is the expression of the soul. Um, you ever hear someone's music and wonder, what in the world are they listening to? Why are they listening to that, right? Um, just, just doesn't, it sound, it's noise to you, right? Um, the, there's certain styles, genre of music that don't make any sense to me, okay? Um, the, the, I don't get when someone's driving beside me and their music is so loud that my car is about to vibrate apart. It doesn't make sense to me because it's like, why would you do that to yourself? I, I don't understand it. Screamo doesn't do anything. For, goth music and, and grunge and uh, emo and there's all kinds of other variations of things, right? Um, uh, none of those things make sense to me. They don't, okay, um, but, but they make sense to the people that are listening to them. I, now, follow me on this thought. I often thought, why would they listen to that? And then it, it clicked with me one day as I was studying this. In some fashion, they see their reflection in that music. Something they don't know how to express is reflected there, right? They're angry, they're frustrated, they're lonely, they're sad, and that's reflected in that music. Um, 
you know, they, they see something about themselves there in that music, right? And as a result, they're drawn to it. They're drawn to it because it says what they don't know how to say. But then what happens is, even as much as it reflects what's in them, it also reinforces those things they don't know how to express, and they begin to reflect it. And so they begin to take on the form or fashion that's presented there. So that's why someone might look like everyone else one day and they start listening to goth music. And, you know, six months from now you see them and they've got their hair dyed black and black fingernails and white makeup and mascara and black trench coat. And you go, wow, what happened to them? Well, what happened to them was they found something that reflected how they felt in their inner man, and then they began to identify with it and reflect it outwardly, right? That's why, you know, uh, maybe in Oklahoma and Texas, uh, sometimes I'll meet someone that looks basically normal, and the next time I meet them, they have a belt buckle this big, you know, and, and boots that are up to their knees and stuff like that. You know what I'm talking about. Do you know that, that uh, with the advancement of technology, and self-driving vehicles, it's only a matter of time before there's a country song released where a man's truck leaves him. So, anyway. Too many, too many country music fans here, I guess. I don't know. Um, all right, so, so it's reflecting, music reflects what's in our soul. I say this on purpose, all right? I'm not, I'm not chasing a rabbit here at all. There is a significant amount of music in the Bible on purpose. Anybody that tells you the Bible doesn't talk about music is just ignorant of the Bible. One-tenth, one out of every ten verses in the Bible either is music or speaks about music. The book of Psalms, the book of Song of Solomon, Lamentations are all completely songs. Not to mention the Song of Moses, the Song of Miriam, and, and so on throughout the Old Testament. And there are some that, that believe that the entire first, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, were all set to music originally. Um, there's there's a, a significant amount of thought toward that. Um, and even the scriptures talk about God said to Moses to teach them the, to, to sing the law so that it would embed in their heart. All right? So music's super important to God. Why is it so important to God? Because God knew that it would be an expression point or an identification point for us when we faced emotional things that we didn't know how else to express. Okay, so when you read the Psalms, they are, it's filled with just huge variety of emotional expression that, that is amazing in its scope, really. I mean, from, from depression, Psalm 42 and 43, uh, uh, stress, Psalm 4, um, betrayal, uh, Psalm, Psalm uh, 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 54, I think, and, and several of those talk about betrayal, um, uh, to incredible joy and, and, and adoration for God and, and just, you know, love and, and all of those type of things are expressed in song in the Scriptures, including... Like Psalm 109, which is imprecatory, and imprecatory means that it's wishing harm on someone else. Those things are included in the Psalms. And You ever read one of those Psalms? And it's like, it's like Dear God, um, please kill this person and kill their wife and kill their children and break down their house and pile it with manure so that everyone that sees it knows that they were mean to me. You've never read that Psalm? I mean, that's like almost verbatim. Okay, and you ever read those and go, oh my, David wasn't a very good Christian. You're not supposed to feel that way if you're a Christian. Well, you're right. He wasn't a good Christian. He was a Jew, actually. So that, there's that. But anyway, but also, this is why the Bible calls David a man after God's own heart. Because David expressed to God everything that was in his heart. And the reason we so often feel distant and separated from God is because we're afraid to tell God all the bad things that are in our heart. Because, you know, we think maybe he'll, He won't think so good of us anymore, as if He didn't know the truth about us anyway. And so David expresses this. Well, here's how you find an outlet. This is, this is so important. 
Just start reading the Scriptures, start reading the Psalms, and look for places that express how you feel. And you say, I don't know how to say how I feel about these things. Well, look for places that express it, and then start there. God, I, that is me. That is exactly how I feel, I, and I didn't know how to say it. But here's the wonderful thing about the Psalms is they never express an emotion without giving an answer. So not only can you find a point of expression and outlet, but you can also find a place of answer for that emotion. By the way, emotions aren't sin. Emotions aren't sin. God gave them to you. God experiences them. If emotions were sin, then God would sin because God expresses emotion. What you do about emotion can be sin. How you respond to it. We often say this, that life isn't about what happens to you. It's about how you respond to it. Right? Two people can experience the same event and one walk away angry and bitter and another walk away thankful. And their, their life from that point on can be completely dramatically changed based on their response to the event. Okay? And, and uh, I'm, I'm just, listen, to, uh, as, as horrible as it is, there are people that have been raped and, and uh, have, have allowed that to dominate their life and destroy their life and, and go off into drugs and addiction and, and many other horrible things and point back and say it was because of that. It was the activating event. But there are other people that have had a similar event, not the same event, but a similar event, but turned that around and gone out and started a shelter for people and, and helped people and ministered to people and changed people's lives in the same activating event. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's not about what happened. Stop, stop blaming what happened. It's about how you think about what happened. That's what, that's what makes the difference in your life. And you have to come to the point where you change your thinking and your thinking needs to be changed according to God's thinking. Like our thinking has to be put off and His thinking has to be put on. We have to put on the mind of Christ. You say, well, how could He understand? Yeah, I know. It's not like He was ever abused or betrayed or had conflict or faced death. or. Oh. Oh, you mean... You mean he was tempted in all points like as we are and yet without sin? And you mean to tell me that, that he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities? Yeah. That's weird. It's almost like the Bible says it specifically. So how do we deal with it? Well, first we create an outlet and then we have to cut off the sources. Now, when we talk about cutting off the sources, I want you to look back to our text again at verse number 18. And notice this, it says, He hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me. Now notice the next statement, for there were many with me. And here's the interesting thing about trauma is that it, we have this tendency then to take traumas in our life and, and um, advertise them as if we were the only one that ever experienced trauma. And um, we create aloneness is magnified in that response. And he specifically says, you're not alone. There were many with you. You're not alone. Uh, 7,000 haven't bowed the knee, right? I mean, there are a lot of people who have experienced what you've experienced. And that's hard sometimes to hear. Uh, we were, um, we were in um, Oregon, pastoring in Oregon, and um, one of our ladies, um, her husband passed away, and uh, we were having a church dinner. He had passed away six, eight months maybe prior to this church dinner, and Another one of our ladies had had um, four husbands pass away, and um, she was, but she was like 96, so okay, so she was pretty old, and, and three of the four had passed away with cancer, right, and then her last passed away without cancer, but um, she decided that was it, she was done with husbands, you know, and so anyway, we're sitting at this dinner, she's sitting beside us, and this other uh, lady was across the table, and she was just telling us just how hard it is to not have a husband. And I certainly think that that's very valid. I'm, I'm talking about me. I'm thinking, man, I don't want to lose my wife and I can't, uh, I don't want her to be a widow for sure. All right, you have to think about that for a minute. But anyway, um, but this lady sitting beside us, it was so 
it was really strange and uncomfortable, to be honest. And because she just had enough of the complaining. And she said to this other lady, she said, oh, just stop it. If you're the only woman who had ever had a husband die, I'd feel sorry for you, but I've lost four. Quit complaining and move on with life. And then she just started eating her jello. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, wow, okay. Um, I don't know what to say, so I just started eating jello too because it was, it was really strange. And, but here's what happens, and this is, uh, please don't think I'm trying to dim- diminish losing a spouse because I'm certainly not any, I'm not trying to diminish that. I'm just simply saying, we're not the only ones, are we? We're not the only ones. Other people have lost, and other people have suffered, and other people have struggled. And we, we've got to quit thinking about just, it's all about what happened to me. And we've got to change our thinking. And if I'm going to change my thinking, I have to stop focusing on what produced the problem And if I'm going to stop focusing on what produced the problem, I have to eliminate my focus on it. And the only way to do that is to take it to the cross and to give it to Christ because there he did all of, he suffered all of these things for us and took all of that sin on himself. And so I take it to the cross. Forgiveness is not about you and it's not about them. It's about him. Now, I explained this last night. We forgive one another as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you, right? So we take it to the cross. We give it to Christ. We exchange our wounds for His scars. Scars are already healed. And, and we extend that forgiveness. Now, let me, let me say this, though, about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not the same thing as restoration. Restoration is like a coin, okay? And um, it has two different sides. One side is forgiveness. Now, think about that side of it for just a second, because you realize that God chose before the foundation of the world to forgive through Christ. In a sense, we might say God is already here waiting for you. When you ask God for forgiveness, He doesn't say, well, let me get back to you, you know, I'll think about it. He's already decided to forgive. Okay, so forgiveness is pre-qualified with God. It's not God's choice to forgive that is in question when we talk about someone's restoration to Him. What is in question is our choice to repent. Restoration happens when forgiveness meets repentance. And if someone is unrepentive, you can still forgive, but you can't restore. And that's biblical, because God has chosen forgiveness but not everyone is going to receive it, but it's not God's choice against it. He's not willing that any should perish. What prevents people from restoration with God is their own refusal to come to the cross. Forgiveness is in a sense saying, I'm going to stand with God at the cross and wait for them. I'm not going to carry the burden anymore. It's His. I'm giving it to Him. I'm not carrying it. And I'm, and I'm willing for restoration to happen when they repent. And a person, who, a person who's repentive, is, it's evident in them. And we don't have time to go into all that, but there's, I, I've written on that also, and there's a lot on that particular front. But, um, but it's evident in a repentant person does not demand forgiveness. You ever, you know, think about that as far as salvation, going to God and saying, God, you, you better forgive me. You, you're God. You have to. Like, he doesn't have to. He chose to. Amen. You don't deserve it. No. Right? Amen. So repentance is not a, is, is not a demanded thing. It's a, it's a requested thing. And the Bible says, bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. In other words, 
It has signs. It has evidences. Okay? Uh, works are not repentance, but repentance produces works. Just like faith is not, works are not faith, but faith without works is dead, right? It's the same, it's the same thing. Now, A lot of marital conflicts and problems, a lot, are produced right here. Um, And we bring this baggage into the marriage, and we don't even know, we don't even know that we're polluting um, our marriage with those things because we don't see them as connected, we don't see them as related, and and yet they are because um, father wounds are going to impact how you respond to your husband, ladies. And men, it's going to impact how you see your role as a husband. Mother wounds similarly do this, do that in a, in a reverse fashion, right? Um Traumas that we bring into our relationship impact how we respond within the relationship. And so if we, if we don't deal with them biblically, then they're going to produce a magnification of problems in our, in our relationship, lots of fruit of problems in our relationship, but, and we'll focus on that and we'll blame the other individual. We'll say, well, it's their fault because, you know, they... They didn't handle the finances right. They weren't, um, uh, they weren't appropriately intimate or they argued about everything and they were a perfectionist and they were this and they just had too much fear and you know, whatever, whatever the things over here are, all of the, all of the fruit. But rea- in reality, we often create the scenario whereby those things become a problem because of the way that we have dealt with and or are escaping dealing with our own traumas. It's much easier to blame someone else than to deal with your own problems. And so this process of dealing with emotional trauma can stop and or heal a lot of marital conflicts if, if you'll do it God's way. Okay. Um, I, I was hoping to deal with a second um, issue, but time-wise we're right there at that um, 1030 mark, uh, about five minutes till. So let me stop and just... See if there are any questions about this before we before we move forward. So, are there any any questions um, anyone has about um, any of this that we've talked about today? Do we have the microphone still? He wanted it on the on the. Oh, we, okay, white or pink? Okay. Here, there. Yeah. Yes, sir. I just have a question. How that y'all, when I say y'all, y'all, uh, your church or your counseling, deal with it in your books or whatever. If, say, I'll just use, if a husband comes without the wife, and he begins to say this, 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 and that, and yeah. rails against his wife, or vice versa. We don't do that. Is that sin to be able to not... If both of them aren't there to talk, is that sin? Talking about the other spouse. No, I don't. I don't know that I would call it sin. I would call it unproductive. Um, it, it'd be sin if they were going around talking, talking, just gossiping, in in ways. If they're coming for counsel, they just don't understand how to pursue counsel and get help. Um, and and um, I don't know that that's intended to be sin in that manner. Um, because most of the time we actually do think that the other person's the problem, uh, but in counseling we don't let that happen. So we would say, you know, I can't counsel someone that's not here. So let's talk about you and and what you need to deal with, how you should be responding to issues in your marriage. And I I can't counsel anyone that's not in front of me. So I don't I don't I just don't let that continue. Um, and we we counsel with the individual that's there. If you'll change you, your spouse will change. And we'll talk more about that later. So that's uh, back over there. So there's a family that had eight children. And 
each of these children went through some kind of emotional, physical, mental abuse. I've been trying to counsel with each of these children in some way, some form. Most of them have an, es or an exit where mm -hmm. they're emptying the emotional reservoir, but one of the inlets they can't seem to cut off is a mother that constantly tries to protrude or intrude into their life. Mm -hmm. And most of these children have forgiven the mother for what's happened during all those times growing up, but the mother doesn't seem to understand that you, you have to repent in order to be a restoration of the relationship. Yeah. How would those children deal with someone that's constantly trying to get into their life that they really don't want in their life unless there's repentance and which would then lead to restoration? So they need to, they need to learn how to set boundaries um, and that's an important part of just teaching principally. Um, and probably the easiest thing I could tell you to do just because of time and, and focus would be to get a, a little booklet. I don't know if you got it, Pastor um, Manipulation, Manipulation yeah. um, by Lou Priolo. It, it's a very small booklet, but it's really good about that. And um, understanding manipulation um, from, from that and then also um, setting boundaries for those that try and manipulate. So I, I would recommend you to read that little booklet. Do you have copies of that with you? I don't. It's not. A, I carry books that I wrote, not... Um, no, if I carried every book I've ever recommended, I wouldn't. I'd be driving a, a truck, you know. Do, uh, but Pastor has one. Well, I'm gonna need to buy eight copies. Do you know where I can buy it from? Yeah, uh, if you, I, I don't. Um, I know, I know we get it, but I can't remember where. And it's expensive. It's cr it's really crazy. It's like five dollars, and it's a little bitty booklet. Um, but it but it works. So it's yeah. So um, uh, but I'm sure if you look on the book that pastor has it it will give you um maybe direction for that um so that's that's what i would recommend any more questions anybody else had a question oh yes right here for someone that's dealt with a lot of emotional pain and past traumas how would you recommend them finding someone like a biblical counselor that would fit their needs it, that's a tough. That's a tough problem right now, and that's why we do what we do, where we we do courses and training. Um, and so you have a couple of men here that are in training for that uh, purpose. Um, there's not a lot out there that I know of that that follow a, a really solid biblical perspective. Um, so that's why I wrote the books that I have, because the emotional pain book. Almost all the books out there have have are set up in a way as to self-counsel in some fashion to where there's exercises that I would have people do if we were counseling. It certainly is more beneficial if there's someone that you can sit across face-to-face -face from, um, but if you use that, that book, it, it would be a starting point for you. And then I, I always recommend that, um, you know, you would go to your pastor because he knows more people in your area. Maybe he knows someone and or maybe he's he and his wife or whoever he knows could help you walk through that material. Maybe they've been through it and, and could help you walk through it. So um, I would talk to your pastor about as far as an individual because other than him, I only know one other person that even lives in this whole area. So um, that's, uh, that's how I would tell you to approach it other than, than traveling. I mean, if you traveled and came up to Oklahoma, um, we do counseling up there, but it's 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 not um, it's more of an intensive thing, and it's um, often when we talk about emotional trauma, it's something that needs to be dealt with more over a longer period of time than a one shot type circumstance. So that makes it a little more difficult. But the book does cover all everything I would teach in counseling. I wrote it for that purpose. Um, so that's that's what Your I would wife say. has a question. My wife. Oh, okay. How much is it? Five ninety nine on Amazon. There you go. Manipulation by Lou Priolo. I can get it for you later and show you exactly what book, what it looks like, and all that. So it's you kind of green. It. You can order it. it's, a gr it's a small green booklet, maybe twenty something pages long. It looks like this little booklet. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a really, workbook. Really small. A little workbook. <coughs> kind of thing, so. right, any other questions? Yes, sir.
they're not listening and that's the way it is to you. You decide to cut off or not. I use a format for counseling that I, te I teach in our courses. Um, Q, Q, J, R, R. This is the introductory formula. Um, and this is question to understand. This is question to reveal. These are based on a, another formula. Activating event plus belief equals consequence. And then judge from the word. Unto repentance. And then um, restructuring. That's, that formula is based on um, how God counsels people in Genesis chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 16, um, other locations, and it's like the same format. God asks questions a lot. Um, where, you know, wherefore art thou? Who told thee thou wast naked? Um, you know, dost thou well to be angry for the gourd, Jonah? You know, I mean, he, he asks question, question, question. So uh, for me... Um, my job as a counselor, the hardest part of the job as a counselor is this one right here. Um, making sure that you actually understand what they're dealing with instead of presuming yeah. to, to know. It's, yeah. it's really takes a lot of questions to, to ask to get through that to that point. And then, and then not getting ahead of yourself because then you need to ask questions until they see the problem themselves and they express the problem um, instead of trying to convince them that you know what the problem is. Because if you, if you think you know what the problem is and you just say, here's your problem, then very often they'll, they'll deny, it. No, that's not the problem. You don't know what you're talking about and, and so forth. And they'll, so you, you have to ask enough questions until they, um, until they see that. And then, and then you judge from the word until there's repentance and so your question is, when do you stop because it's not moving forward? The answer is, if they're unwilling to come to repentance on that issue, then you're done. Yeah, I just tell them that's until you come to the place where, I mean, you know, because they've already revealed what the problem is. Here's what the Bible says. And, and if you're not willing to follow what the Bible says, then there's nothing else we can do. So I just tell them until you're willing to do what the Bible says about this, then there's nothing else we can do. And if they're willing to, then we go to restructuring, and restructuring is a five-part process based on the book of Mark. Um, and without going into huge detail, it's the training process. Um, and so I teach this, as a matter of fact, when, with children, right? And uh, even in, in jobs or whatever, um, and, and counseling is the same. So, um, you know, you instruct and then you demonstrate, and then they participate, and then you observe, and then you correct. And that's the, that's the training process. Every, all good training follows that process. It's what Jesus did with the disciples. And so um, instruction, participation, uh, I'm sorry, instruction, demonstration, participation, observation, correction. And um, so that's how we restructure as well. That's, that's, this, that's the forma, formula for down here. Um, and uh, parents, if you'll, if you'll apply that in your own child rearing, um, it'll help your kids instead of like jumping to discipline. Discipline comes at the end of the training process after someone refuses to, to you know, do what they've been trained to do. But we have a tendency to jump straight to discipline. And uh, the Bible does not say beat up a child in the way he should go, right? I mean, um, it's train. And, um, but then also... We make a mistake. I don't know why I'm, I'm kind of rambling on this, but the truth is, is we also make a mistake because I've heard people say, "Well, is that a promise? Train up a child in the way he should go when he's old, and not depart from it." That's a promise. If you if you take them to church and you do this and you do this, they will turn out this way. That is not a promise. No, right. it's not a promise, and it's not a principle. It's a proverb. You know how I know? It's in the book of Proverbs. <laughs> <laughs> what is a proverb? A proverb is a general truth, meaning it's generally true. It's more likely, if you raise a child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, that they are going to 
continue in that. It's not guaranteed. Amen. It's not. You know why? Because they have a free will. Amen. And if it were guaranteed, then it would have to work both ways. You understand what I just said? Like, in other words, if someone was trained up to cuss and drink and smoke and sleep around, then that would have to, they would not be able to turn away from that either. It's not, see, in other words, for something to be true, it has to be falsifiable. There has to be an alternate. And if we believe that people can turn away from wrong upbringing to do right, then it's also true that people can turn away from right upbringing to do wrong. Yeah. But generally, if we train them biblically, generally speaking, they're going to want to continue on. Right? So that's a proverb. And that question, because some of you were asking, they couldn't hear your question, so they were curious what you asked, was how long do you counsel with somebody before it, you say, I'm, I'm done, right. I'm, I'm done dealing with the issue? Right. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions? Ms. Bethany. Yes, sir. He had a, over here. Michael. Just curious, so um, with the, I guess like under like a rough average, or like rough uh, maybe percentage, how many people do you counsel where they're just totally at their wits end, they don't know what's the issue, like what's the root of what they're struggling with versus how many people have an idea that there is something wrong in their life, like at the root of it, but they either are not connecting the dots that this is resulting does that make sense? Like where they're coming in, they already know it's wrong, but they're hoping that maybe you'll just help them fix the issue, like on the surface level. Does most that counseling sense? is um, people come most of the time for counseling because of the consequences they're experiencing, as opposed to they have they know what's wrong and they just don't know how to fix it. Um, they they just want the consequences to stop primarily. Okay. Um, but that's that's general speaking. Most don't know what the root is now. No. That's not universal, but that's generally speaking. Yep. Any other question? Okay, uh, like a five, ten minute break. <clears throat> Let me say this about the, one of the things he said was the, um, the question that was asked a while ago about some of this is, all this is really good, but the problem is you've got to apply these mm -hmm. things. And, and, and when you were saying, where do we find a good counselor in the area, what he said, which was so good, is God has to become the counselor, mm -hmm. and the Bible has to become the counselor. And you've got to get to the place that, that you know, find good people that can point in the right direction, but no one ever wants you to become dependent on the pastor yes. or a man or a counselor, yes. or my next appointment to get through this week. Yes, It has to get to the place, like he said, that it is, I'm learning how to walk on my own with the Spirit of God, the Word of God, talking to God, and the outlets that God has provided. That's what we're shooting you towards. We never want you to say, all right, well, i got to get to the pastor to get through this week. It's got to be my time with the Lord to yes. get through this week. absolutely. That's what we need. Amen. All right, so let's take about a five, ten-minute break and come right back in. Cool.